Good morning, students, colleagues, friends, and families. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the Spring 2021 Senior Research Symposium. Today is a culmination of many hours of hard work. You, the presenting students, have searched through databases and papers. You have defined a question. You have read paper after chemistry paper, and as a biologist, I congratulate you on that feat. You may have spent mornings, middays, and afternoons in the lab. You've planned and you've replanned and you've troubleshooted and you've adjusted your plans again. You may have synthesized some compounds and you certainly synthesized findings, perhaps your own, perhaps from others, perhaps both. You've spent hours in front of your computer analyzing, writing, and practicing your speech. Now you have put everything together and you get to show off all you've done. We are so proud of you. Faculty mentors, congratulations. I know how much of your hard work is represented here. Friends and family, congratulations to you too. You've listened as your student poured out his trials and frustrations through this whole thing. Thank you for supporting them in all this time and we're delighted that you're here to share in their success. And with that, I will turn this back over to Dr. Wen who will explain how to enter the virtual breakout rooms. Thank you so much. That was wonderful, Dr. Mark Hutchins. Um, and we also want to congratulate the School of Science and Medicine for the student government last night. We won the best department. So congratulations to faculty, students, and staff for um, that great achievement. And Brendan won the Laker of the Year Award. So that was also um, congratulations to you as well. And um, Dr. So, Wen won the uh, Advisor of the Year Award. Well, so thank you very much. <laughs> this morning, we have two rooms, the Beaker Room and the Bunsen Room. Um, according to our undergraduate students, they thought that the we've reasoning for the Beaker and the Bunsen Room was because it was science terminology. Um, and how many of you actually know that that was a reference to the Muppet movie? So, so only most of us faculty members, so we're the only ones that thought that was, okay. Um, so there is a, if, you, if you're not sure what it is, you should Google Bunsen and Beaker and you should pick that up. Okay, um, so the schedule, we're going to keep a schedule so that you are free to move back and forth between any of the rooms as you wish. You can see the schedule there. I've also put the, a picture of the schedule in the chat in case you need to find it again later. Um, and it's also on the website. Um, so at 910, uh, we'll start the first presentation with Justin in the, the Beaker Room and then Mariah in the Bunsen Room. And um, we're, again, I, we're going to keep to the schedule. And then if you are able to stay around afterwards, we'll do a quick presentation of awards for the outstanding graduates um, for this year. And we're also going to name them for last year because we didn't have the opportunity. So we'll be presenting them with awards. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, you can type them in the chat or you can unmute yourself. Otherwise, I will leave you to split into the rooms. If you need help getting into a room, I can assign you to one um, as your switchboard operator. Um, just let me know if you need any help. Otherwise, uh, go ahead, I'm gonna open the rooms and you can split. Uh, faculty that are grading, you may go to whichever room you would like to go to. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Justin Blaylock, and this is my presentation on the uptake of per and polyfluoroalkyl substances or PFAS in cannabis sativa. So first we're just going to start with a general overview of what PFAS is. They are man-made aliphatic hydrocarbons where either some or all the hydrogens have been replaced with fluorines. They were first created in 1946 by DuPont and today there's around four to five thousand different PFAS derivatives that exist. They're found in many everyday products such as textiles or carpeting, on state cookware, cosmetics, fast food packaging, among other things. And today they're defined as a persistent organic pollutant by the EPA. And here you can see some various classes and structures of different PFOS. And you notice how the structures are very similar to that of lipids or fats, and that they have a polar head group and a straight chain non-polar tail. And this gives them a lot of versatility in use, which is one reason why they've been used so extensively since 1946. Another reason they've been used so extensively is their high thermal, biological, and chemical inertness. Um, this is largely due to the um, high number of carbon fluorine bonds that are present in these molecules. You can see over here the ionization potential, electron affinity, and electron negativity of fluorine is higher than that of fluorine, and this lends itself to stronger bonds to carbon. 
And because of this, they remain unchanged in the presence of many acids or bases, oxidants or, duct or reductants, and even UV irradiation. They're also resistant to temperatures up to 900 degrees Celsius, which for the discussion of cannabis is very important because that's the average burning temperature of the cigarette. And because they've been used so extensively since their inception in 1946, they're ubiquitous in the environment today and they're considered forever chemicals because they don't break down. You can see most of it stems from industry where it makes its way into consumer products and the environment and eventually to us. Um, and it's, con it's estimated that over 90% of Americans contain traceable levels of PFAS in their blood serum. And in the environment, they're known to cause oxidative stress and metabolic imbalances in plants. They're also known to cause many adverse health outcomes in humans. They tend to bind to human serum albumin and they bioaccumulate in the liver and kidneys where they can cause a plethora of issues. Uh, on the right, you can see a figure that shows uh, various adverse health outcomes. The ones in bold are, have a strong correlation to PFAS exposure and the ones that aren't in bold are suspected to be the cause of PFAS exposure but aren't quite as certain. And the main route of exposure to PFAS is ingestion but inhalation and absorption are also possible. And because this um, contamination is so pervasive, because they don't break down in the environment, and because they're known to cause adverse health outcomes, the main goal of this research was to examine PFAS uptake in plants and how that applies to cannabis. Also to call to attention the likely um, PFAS contamination of various cannabis products if it is making its way into cannabis. So this is a literature-based review. It was broke, my literature search was broken down into five different categories, and peer review publications were taken from online journal databases such as ACS Publications, um, SciFinder, or Google Scholar. And you can see on the right in this table some various search words or phrases that were used to find only pertinent publications, and some exclusionary criteria that were um, enacted were your publication and the quality of methods implemented for growing various vegetables in these um, contaminated PFAS environments. So what was probably the most surprising thing that was found was that diet actually is the most common route of exposure to PFAS. There has been a lot of past research done and focused on drinking water, but it turns out that diet is actually the most common route of exposure. That's likely due from agriculture uptake through the soil, groundwater, or irrigation water. And for cannabis, that um, for PFAS rather, that plant uptake is both apoplastic and symplastic, which is to say both through the cell wall and also through the cytoplasm. Now, short chain PFAS tend to have an easier time being taken up into the plant than their longer chain counterparts, and that's most likely due to the Casparian strip. And what this is, is a band of cell wall material that is chemically different from the rest of the cell wall. And its job is to inhibit the uptake of various toxins or pollutants from the environment. And just because of the sheer size of the long chain PFAS, it is um, hypothesized that, that, that the Casparian strip is very effective at preventing the long chain PFAS from being taken up into the plant. And the literature has established a direct correlation between PFAS concentration in soil or groundwater and the resultant concentration in plant biomass. And this is better described by these two graphs here. The one on the right is log scale root concentration factor of various PFAS. And root concentration factor is defined as the ratio of soil to root concentration. And you can see the upward trend with increasing chain length with PFBA having four carbons, PFOA having eight carbons and going up from there. And what this shows is that long chain PFAS tend to absorb or adsorb to the roots um, much more than the short chain PFAS, which are more mobile in the environment. And the right graph here shows average translocation factor of various PFAS. And translocation factor is defined as the ratio of shoot to root concentration. And so what this shows is that short chain PFAS over here are much more likely to be translocated throughout the plant than their longer chain counterparts, which are more likely to stay in the roots. And that's even further supported by these graphs here, which show the percent distribution of PFAS into different plant tissues of four garden vegetables. And you can see the two left bars in each graph are short chain PFAS. And you can see a larger percentage of total PFAS is translocated to the leaves, heads, or fruits of these various plants. Whereas the longer chain PFAS on the two right bars of each graph tend to accumulate and stay in the roots of the plant. Um, that chain length is actually the most important thing when considering plant partitioning of PFAS followed by pH and soil organic matter. So what are the implications of this? Well, it 
um, it shows that long chain PFAS are much more persistent in the environment and they do not move around as much, but the silver lining is they're much harder to uptake. Whereas short chain PFAS are much easier to uptake into plants, but the silver lining there is that they're more mobile. So they're not around for as long, except when grown indoors, which a lot of cannabis is. And that's because in the environment throughout the growing season, short chain PFAS has the ability to be mobile and leach out elsewhere away from the plants. Whereas when you're growing indoors, you're growing in a pot and that, that has nowhere to go. And so the short chain PFAS do accumulate in those pots over the growing season. And so they're more bioavailable to the plant that way. And cannabis might be at a larger risk of PFAS contamination than household grown vegetables because it has a very aggressive root system. Um, cannabis sativa has been used to hyper, it is a hyper accumulator, and it has been used for phytoremediation of heavy metals in heavy metals contaminated areas because of that aggressive root system. It uptakes nutrients and heavy metals and possibly PFAS very aggressively. And so going forward, there's some areas of research that are, um, need more attention. PFAS soil chemistry and behavior is one of them to better understand how it's moving within the environment. Plant specific uptake mechanisms, especially when it comes to cannabis sativa, is something that needs to be more researched to understand what the plant is doing with this PFAS when it uptakes it. Atmospheric deposition is a possible um, route of exposure to PFAS. There are some, there's some research coming out of China that shows agricultural grows that are near floral chemical plants are finding larger concentrations of PFAS in the plants than they are in the soil, which stands to reason that the nearby floral chemical plant might be contaminating these uh, crops through atmospheric deposition. And finally, hexafluoro propylene oxide dimer acid, which is called Gen X, um, is a general PFAS replacement for the now banned PFOA and PFOS. Yet there's research that suggests it might be just as toxic as its predecessor. And so more research is needed on Gen X to fully understand it. We know and it's been established that PFAS is a persistent organic pollutant. It is very pervasive in the environment. It's not readily broken down in the environment or in us. It's taken up into plants and it's known to cause adverse health outcomes. So as the cannabis market continues to grow in the United States at the rate that it is, there is much more investigation that needs to be done to understand if PFAS is a potential contaminant and a threat to the cannabis industry. Thank you very much for listening. Okay. Anyone have any questions for Justin? No questions for Justin? I, I have a question. Dr. Mosey, go ahead. All right, Justin. So I saw in the uh, presentation, you mentioned about uh, potted plants versus agriculture, outdoor plants, and talking about uh, the rate of leaching. <clears throat> Excuse Sorry. me. Sorry. So my, my question is, is that, um, so how, uh, how water soluble are these PFAS molecules? Uh, they're not very water soluble. So when you talk about this being in, okay, so if you're talking about the potted plant and being able to leach, how, how are they leaching? How are they moving around if they're not water soluble? What's transporting them around the garden? Um, do you mean in the potted plants or out in like an open grow? Right, because you, you said in potted plants, they don't leach, but you said in open grow, they do. So I'm just curious as to how, how those chemicals are moving around and leaching around if they're not water soluble. Um, well, so throughout the growing season, when uh, if you have a, a torrential downpour, or a big rain or something like that, they have the ability to move around and leach away if it's any sort of slope or anything like that. In a potted plant, when you keep watering, if your water is contaminated with it, or even if it's in the soil or any sort of fertilizer you use, it has nowhere to go. It just sits down there. And so throughout the growing season, it tends to be available to the plant throughout the entire season, whereas in out in... Um, like an open grow, if you're tilling up the soil or if you're um, a torrential downpour or something like that, heavy rains, they have the ability to be moved elsewhere. And with the shorter chain PFAS, they're much more mobile in the environment. They don't adsorb to the root of the plants like the large chain PFAS do. And so they are able to move away. Whereas in a pot, they have nowhere to go. They just sit there at the roots and they can be absorbed throughout the growing season. Yeah, but it sounds like you answered correctly. It sounds like it's physical methods rather than uh, being dissolved. So right when you said tilling the soil and moving stuff around, and then yeah, the big downpours, that's what I assume as well. Yeah, I did have one question. Uh, you mentioned uh, the, the atmospheric deposition work you know, coming out of China in that regard. Uh, in the, the studies that were done there, did you notice if they were talking about whether the PFAS was on the plant or was it in the plant from the uh, studies? They were, so they did kind of, some of the studies I saw were both. 
they one tried to look at surface um, levels of PFOS and they also would just take the whole plant and grind it up and look at the total PFOS that way. And most of what they found was that the when they ground it up, there was higher levels in the plant than what they were finding in the soil. And so their, um, their hypothesis was that it's still able to be taken up through the plant through um, like instead of through the roots actually being deposited on top of the plant and being absorbed that way. And they think that the nearby floral chemical plants were contributing to that through atmospheric deposition. Very good. Anyone else have any questions? Yeah, uh, just to follow up, that's an interesting question because uh, we find that a lot of the uh, research on hyperaccumulators is uh, pointing out that uh, a lot of the metals that we thought were hyperaccumulated uh, are actually adhered to the outside of the plant in many cases, and so haven't actually been taken into the plant. Um, you know, there's a question if you're using it as a uh, for phytoremediation, if that matters, right? Mm -hmm. But from a plant physiology standpoint, that's a very different mechanism. Yeah, so that was the case with many of the larger chain ones. Eight carbons and up is what I found is they weren't necessarily taken into the plant. They were, however, adsorbed to the outside of like on the root surface. Very good. Any last questions for Justin? I, I did have uh, an error on my part, Justin. I forgot to give you a proper introduction. Uh, oh. Justin's <laughs> post post-graduation plans uh, he is uh, actually looking for um, employment, and uh, I think you'll be very successful in that regard. And his fun fact is he is engaged. Uh, and the, the second point of that fun fact is I was like the last person in the state to find <laughs> out. Uh, so he kept it a secret for me forever. Not that I'm hurt at all. <laughs> uh, if I have a little bit of time, I do. I didn't mention sure. it in my video, but I just want to say thank you to um, both you, Professor Southwell, and also Dr. Wynn for your help on this project, and also just to the staff and faculty at Lake State just for the education I've received over the last four years. The department really does a great job of helping students and just caring about their students, and I really appreciate all the education that I received in the last four years. Now you're going to make me get all emotional. So thank you, everyone. <laughs> okay. Justin, thank you for that. We'll head into our next speaker by my list. We have Hannah up next. So Hannah is also looking for a job. Say hello, Hannah. Hello. So also looking for a job post-graduation. And her fun fact was that she likes to bake, but doesn't actually eat what you like to, what you bake. Are, are you, is there a reason for that? Um, well, it's not that I don't like to eat what I, what I bake. It's just that I don't like to eat a lot of it. So I'll like eat like one or two of the things that I make and then I just give it all away because I would rather have other people have it than hoard it to myself. <laughs> I like that. I always get nervous about chefs that don't eat their own food. So, okay, it's uh, 925. I'll begin the next presentation. We'll follow up with questions after that. Hi everyone, for those who don't know me, my name is Hannah Suchek and my senior research was a lab-based project on the ICPMS comparison of duct tape adhesives to try to match a specific sample to a roll or brand of duct tape. So to start, you need to know that duct tape has three primary parts, the film or the silver backing of the tape, the cloth or the scrim of the tape, which is just these thin threads that keep the backing and the adhesive together, and the adhesive of the tape, which is what we'll be focusing on today. So duct tape analysis in crimes. First of all, we know that duct tape is used often in crimes to bind the mouth or the hands together or to something. So it is important to be able to analyze a sample of tape that is found at a scene and try to match it to a particular suspect. So there are a couple ways that labs actually do this and matching. So what they would do would be to find a sample of tape from a crime scene and then have something to compare it to from a suspect. So what they could do is take the role from the suspect and be able to analyze the most recent tear and try to compare it and line it up to the tear that was found from the crime scene. Just like in this picture here, you can see that the tape lines up almost perfectly in both the scenarios. So that would be an end match. But the problem with this is if the tape was used again, for example, or if the suspect tore it off because they knew that this was a thing that they could do, they wouldn't be able to end match at all. 
So there's a more chemistry involved analysis of duct tape that they use, which is using X-ray fluorescence and Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy to analyze the components of the tape. FTIR is good for analyzing organic materials and also qualitatively telling you what is in the sample, whereas XRF is more useful for analyzing solid materials as well as quantitatively telling you what is in a sample. So how successful are they right now in analyzing duct tape in these ways? Right now they find that the success rate for these methods is about 68%, and studies have found that when trying to use any scientific method in a court or in a trial, the usability decreases with anything that has a success rate lower than 90%, especially in more serious crimes, which is usually where you would find duct tape. Research from Macaulay, Bach, Bajic, and Hook have found that ICPMS can actually increase the success rate to above 90%, which would be very useful in using in trial. So why would we use ICPMS? So ICPMS could be a single technique that they could use to analyze the tape which would be very beneficial for backups and price in a lab. It also has a higher sensitivity than XRF, and it's able to analyze elements that have a smaller mass, such as lithium and beryllium and other similar elements like that. When I was gathering my samples, I went to the local Meyer and Walmart and bought three brands of tape, duck brand duct tape, T-Rex tape, and Gorilla tape. I bought two rolls of each, one from Meyer and one from Walmart, because I thought that this might help vary the lot or the batch that the duct tape was manufactured in. I took three samples from each roll, and the samples were 10 by 10 centimeters in area. This was to try to help get the same amount of adhesive for each sample. I acid washed falcon tubes to clean them before I prepared the samples as well. So for sample preparation, I based my sample preparation on work from Dobney, Wiarda, Dejude, and Vanderpeel because they did similar research with packing tape, and I figured that packing tape and duct tape would be similar enough to be able to base the research off of that. Their best solvent was found to be methanol, so that's what I used for this. I soaked each of the 10 by 10 samples in the falcon tubes with methanol to try to loosen the adhesive from the backing so it could be removed. And I just used a paint scraper to scrape the adhesive off of it. And this was really easy for the T-Rex tape and the Gorilla tape, but for the duck brand duct tape, it was insanely difficult to get the adhesive off. After all of the adhesive was scraped off from the backing, I placed it back into the respective methanol that it was soaking in and let the methanol evaporate in the fume hood overnight. So the next step was to digest the samples with microwave digestion. So to do this, I acid washed the vials that would be used for microwave digestion. And then I placed each adhesive sample into a tube and added nine milliliters of nitric acid and added one milliliter of hydrochloric trimethylglycine. And then I also prepared three blanks that had just the nitric acid and the trimethylglycine and no adhesive. And then the samples were microwave digested on the USP organic setting. And then after they were done digesting, I placed them back into their respective falcon tubes and diluted them to 50 milliliters with ultra pure water. We had to wait a few days to get some materials for the ICPMS. So when we came back to the samples a couple days later, we found that there were some particles floating in it. We assume that this was probably titanium dioxide, which is a white pigment that they use in adhesives sometimes. So we centrifuged the samples to make sure that there were no solids in it because that is bad for the ICPMS. Took an aliquot from the top and then loaded them into the auto sampler along with standards and then analyzed them via ICPMS. So for data analysis, the blanks were accounted for. This just means that the concentration of metals in each of the blanks was subtracted from the concentrations that were found in each of the samples. And then I converted the units from parts per billion and parts per million to nanograms per centimeter squared. And then I decided to run an analysis of variance test or an ANOVA test. And this type of test requires that there are no negatives or no zero values for any of the samples. So I had to determine the detection limit for each metal, which was done by taking one half of the standard deviation of the blank concentrations for each metal and then these values were plugged into any zeros or negatives that were found in order to run the ANOVA test. And the null hypothesis of the ANOVA test was that the concentrations are the same from brand to brand, 
and the goal was to reject this hypothesis. So as for results of the ANOVA test, it was found that for almost all of the elements, we were able to reject the null hypothesis. So for almost all of the elements, it was found that the concentrations of the metals were different from brand to brand. So I wanted to give a better visual of the ANOVA results besides just a giant table. I only made these for three of the elements, and this was because the concentrations of these metals in the duck brand duct tapes had some differences to them. So the other ones, they were all less than the detection limit, so they all had the same value and showed no variance whatsoever. So that's not a very interesting thing to look at in ANOVA results. So as you can see in these two yellow ones, there isn't a lot of variance, but there is still a little bit. And then you can see in the others that there is some significant variance in, in them. And then this is just another ANOVA analysis for manganese which again, not a lot of variance in the duck brand, but the rest of them show some variance. So what does this mean? So for almost all the metals analyzed, there was a difference in concentrations between the brands. However, this does not show what the difference is or how much of a difference it is. But it does show that ICPMS may be able to aid in the analysis of duct tape adhesive with more research. Another thing that I wanted to look at was the consistency between lots. So for the three samples for each brand, were those samples within the brand consistent for each other? So as you can see with the duck brand, there's not a lot of variance here besides one or two points. That's because a lot of them were less than the, de the detection limit. But for the rest of them, you can see that there is some variance here. So this one's for cobalt. And then sodium, the same thing you can see, not a lot of variance with the duck brand, but the rest of them show some variance. And then with manganese as well, not a lot of variance. Even the T-Rex tape doesn't show a lot of variance, but, the, but some of them do. So in this case, if you found a sample in a crime scene, you might not be able to take that, run it through the ICPMS, and be able to match it to the roll because the lots are so inconsistent. So looking into this a little bit deeper, as you can see here, this is from the Meyer website. There are so many types of just duct brand duct tape alone. So what about color? Does color affect it? Definitely more research needs to be done in order to determine this. Uh, more samples need to be tested. It needs to be repeated multiple times in order to use this in the lab at all. The ICPMS also may be useful in combination with FTIR and XRF in order to get more accurate results. So why were the concentrations so low? So when you think about it, Duct tape adhesive is probably just made of mainly organic materials, and we were analyzing metals. So the concentration of metals probably wouldn't be too high from the ICPMS. And how can this research be improved? So I talked earlier about how the adhesive from the duct brand samples were so hard to get off. More solvents would need to be tested in order to figure out if there was a better solvent to use for this. I personally didn't want to try to do any other solvents because I was worried that they would dissolve the backing too much or might dissolve some of the metals out. So for final conclusions, my research found that most concentrations of metals and duct tape adhesive are different between brands. More testing is definitely needed to be able to use this in a lab setting, especially in a forensics lab setting, to possibly use this in a trial. And also best methods need to be determined in order to be able to do this most effectively. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Hannah to get us started? Yes, out of all of them, were you able to determine which duct tape had like the strongest adhesive properties? Just out of curiosity. Um, not from like using the ICPMS, but from okay. um, actually handling the tape itself, I found that duct, or the T-Rex tape actually was the hardest to handle because it kept sticking to everything. So trying to get an accurate sample of that was pretty hard. <laughs> but um, yeah, I would say that the T-Rex tape probably was the strongest out of all of them. All righty. Uh, I had a quick question. Uh, you mentioned that you determined MDLs based on half the value ab above the blank. Half the value of the blank above that, is, is that correct? It was 
the detection limit was three times the standard deviation of the blanks. And um, the value that I used for the ANOVA test was one half of the detection limit. OK, that makes more sense. Or not, maybe I misunderstood that when you <laughs> said that before. Uh, last question I have. Uh, you also mentioned uh, FTIR and XRF uh, technologies. Uh, how would those be used for this? Do you, do you know? Um, so for like FTIR, they would use it to determine what metals were in duct tape, if there were any, so they could use it to determine the profile. And then XRF would be used to try to figure out how much, but not, but XRF is not as sensitive as ICPMS is. So ICPMS might help with a more sensitive analysis. In general, the FTIR is going to be looking for more of the organic characteristics. Yes. The, the bonds in that regard. XRF will actually start to look for some of the metals. And the part I was wondering if you were going to get to from a, a crime scene standpoint, forensic standpoint, both of those technologies are available in handheld you know, essentially they look like like guns now that you can put it right up to your sample and away you go right in the field. It's kind of neat. Yeah. Any last questions? Otherwise, we'll get ready to move on. Carly's looking overtly nervous. Okay. Thank you for pointing it out. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Hannah. Okay, we're headed on to Carly next. Uh, Post-graduation plans. She's going to Loyola Medical, right? You have a technician job there? Yeah, I'm working with their medicine practice to be a support laboratory staff. Congratulations on that. And your fun fact is you have built your own computer, like from the ground with boxes and like you ordered specific parts and put the together thing, like that kind of build? Kind of, I got donated a PC, so I kind of had to troubleshoot what was wrong with it and fix the parts that needed to be fixed. That's above my skill set. Nice work. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I did just take some comment, Dr. Mighton, we ended down here. We have about a minute left for going. Is the audio really choppy? Are you guys getting that? Or is it sounding okay on the videos? It sounds okay for me. The video okay. from your room is perfect and audio too. The audio from another room is non-existent. But I, okay, I will work on that here in just a second. So we let's get Carly queued up. Hi, my name is Carly. I'm going to be discussing heavy metal determination in industrial hemp samples using ICPMS analytical methods. So a big area of concern in our environmental systems right now is the issue of heavy metal contamination. This poses a big risk for humans in particular when exposed to these heavy elements. And these exposure risks vary based on element type. So if it's mercury versus lead or gold versus mercury in that aspect, exposure route and duration. So how do these contaminants get into what we're particularly looking at is our plants. So contaminants can either come from the air, the water or the soil and they will be uptaken by the plant and when we eat those plants, that becomes the real issue. So these contaminants get into our systems through a variety of methods. Overpopulation and extreme food demands kind of go hand in hand. In the green revolution right now, we are seeing a massive amount of technologies and chemicals being used in our agricultural systems. So any of the chemicals or contaminants that were present in that process are now present in the plants that we're consuming. And plants will continue to retain these heavy elements until they are either consumed by us or by an animal. Because of the long lasting have lives of heavy elements, plants can't degrade those. For our project, we are interested in our cannabis genus. So while we are specifically looking at hemp, we can use hemp in this project to bridge a gap into marijuana, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So cannabis genus in general is often used for phytoremediation, which means it's using plants to better the environment and get rid of some of those contaminants. So cannabis as a genus is known for its great efficacy in absorbing metals and pollutants from soils. So we can plant these cannabis plants, either hemp or marijuana, and it'll uptake all of those unnecessary contaminants in our soil, which might be infecting society as well. 
So because of the public increase in medicinal use of marijuana specifically, there is very little research in how heavy metals in those cannabis products that are being smoked and consumed are affecting humans. And our project allows our analysis of heavy metals in hemp because it's easier to obtain and use in a commercial setting. And we can apply what we find in this methodology to how we're testing marijuana. The problem that we're having though, is that marijuana is not federally legal. So what that means is there's no federal testing standards or regulations for what's being sold to the public. A lot of states are having to determine their own action limits as to how potent a product can be for a consumer, as well as analyzing the risks that may come with that. The action limits will often include most of the heavy elements, so mercury, lead, arsenic, and cadmium, but some states are expanding it to greater extent. The action limits will set a standard as to how much of that particular element can be in the product that they're selling. And here we can see a comparison of Michigan's products between an inhaled marijuana flower and inhalable marijuana concentrate or other marijuana products. And here you can see that Michigan actually tests for six heavy elements. So mercury, lead, arsenic, cadmium, chromium, and nickel. Most, like I said, only screen for the top four. So how did our project work? So we started with industrial hemp that was obtained from Chatham, Michigan via a project with MSU and what they're doing in analyzing hemp samples for commercial use. We obtained these samples and we dried them and then ground them up to be digested and diluted later. We decided to incorporate a spike into our methodology to assess our method and better analyze how our machine is picking up elements. So from there, we were able to prepare our cannabis and mercury standards, and then we were able to load our samples in and obtain data. Once we obtained our data, we were able to analyze that data and report it based on however the state governments reported. So a little bit of background into what ICPMS is. ICPMS stands for Inductively Coupled Plasma Mass Spectrometry. Insert your sample as a liquid form into your sample and a nebulizer mixed with argon gas will turn it into very, very tiny particles in the spray chamber. And as the particles are moving through the plasma source, they become ions as they're heated up to a really high temperature. Once they go through a few different cones, which filter out, they're focused into a beam, which allows the quadrupole to scan all of the individual elements. From there, the detector will collect ions and analyze them within a certain mass range so that we know how much of each element is in our sample. Apart from the three samples, arsenic levels were, were reported less than 0.07 micrograms per gram. What this means is all of the samples that were tested for arsenic were less than the threshold value. The threshold detection limit tells us that below that certain number, we cannot guarantee the accuracy of the number that the instrument found. That's usually three times the standard deviation. In mercury, we found that all of the samples were reported less than 0.017 micrograms per gram, that number being the threshold detection limit for mercury. In chromium, we found that all except three samples were reported less than 0.042 micrograms per gram, that number also being the threshold detection limit. So here we can see the graphical comparison of cadmium in our samples. So the dark green samples are batch one, which was obtained in October of 2019. The lime green is batch two, which was obtained in October 2020. So we can see here that all of our samples fall below the Michigan action limit. The Michigan action limit is that 0.4 micrograms per gram and that dark red line up at the top. It is important to note that all of this in this graph and the ones following, there's going to be a very, very large gap in between that detection limit, which isn't accurately portrayed in this comparison. Here we can see lead, which is graphically compared 
from batch one to batch two again. All of our samples fell below Michigan action limits of 1.0, as you can see denoting on um, that red line. And here you can see the comparison of nickel between the samples. You can see again that all of them fell below the Michigan action limits of 1.0 micrograms per gram. You can see that orange line denoting the less than 0.043 micrograms per gram, which is the threshold value of the nickel. So here you can see the spike recovery graph that shows the comparison amongst the elements of interest. So chromium, nickel, arsenic, cadmium, and lead. Mercury is not included in this graph because it was not present in our standards that we use. Our standards are often used for spike recovery because it allows us to test the matrix, matrix recovery of the instrument. So you can see here that they're all graphed as percent recovery and all of them fall about 20% above average of 100%, which I explain why that is in the next slide here. So here you can see our ongoing method improvements. I know that I talked a little bit about our spike recovery in the last slide. To add on to that, one of the biggest things that we wanted to learn from this experience was why those recoveries were systematically greater than 100%. All of them were on average about 20% higher. We accounted this for pipetting or dilution calculation errors, as well as the fact that our sample mass between our T, TRT-36 and the TRT-36 spike sample masses when we ground the hemp were significantly different. So we in the future would make sure that those two samples being from the same hemp sample were the same mass to begin with. We think that that contributed a lot of error specifically because of the calculation process. Another area that we would like to focus on in the future is the batch differences. So the analysis of the two variations between batch one and batch two. Another area of concern that we would go on changing in the future is our programming. We would actually choose to reconfigure the cannabis method to analyze more isotopes. So our research allows us to make the comparison between hemp and cannabis and the growing marijuana industries. In the future, we would like to expand our methodology to better determine heavy metals in these particular products to allow humans to be consuming marijuana in safer settings. I would like to give a thanks to Professor Ben Southwell, Dr. Derek Wright, and, and Dr. Thu Nguyen for their help and support during this entire project. Thank you. Do you have any questions for Carly? Hi, Carly, I have a question. Yeah. So um, going back, you, you talk about spiking your samples, and I got a little bit lost in your discussion of spiking. So can you explain to me uh, what you mean by when, when you spiked your samples? Yeah. So we had um, one particular sample that we doubled, and we used that to spike it with a known amount of concentration of a standard. And from there, we were able to test our matrix recovery by noting that we knew that there was more of each element in the standard. I had uh, one question uh, related to the, the samples you were analyzing. Uh, did yes. you happen to, to make note of or, or notice any differences in the, the composition of the samples? Uh, so these were, you mentioned, I think, industrial hemp samples. I mean, were there more uh, buds or the stalks or stems or, you know, what types of parts of the plant uh, did you observe? Yeah, so when I was first collecting my samples, because the two batches were from 2019 and 2020, um, they were going to be a little bit different to begin with. And I tried to keep my samples in particular um, equal to each other. Um, the biggest difference I think that we noted between the two batches was the fact that batch two had a significant amount of silica present and that actually caused us to have to make a secondary dilution of our samples. So we centrifuged the um, silica down and got some of the sample dilution up at the top, pipetted that and re-diluted it so that that silica didn't affect our analysis in the ICPMS process. 
Why, why would silica have affected it? Um, because ICPMS has to be a liquid for it to be analyzed and it can like clog the system if there's any solid present whatsoever. Kind of like what Hannah was talking about. I'll buy into that. <laughs> and we have any other questions for Carly? No student questions? No Dr. Wright questions? I was just listening to her answers. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't accusing you of not being here, Dr. Wright, but now I feel like you felt guilty about something. Well, we're going to be very fortunate <laughs> if my two year old doesn't ask questions. So. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Carly. Thank you. Okay, we'll get on into our next speaker. Miranda, I think you're on tap next. You also look nervous. You'll do fine. Remember, this is pre-recorded. Don't, don't stress out a whole lot. Uh, so Miranda's uh, post-graduation plans are she has a job for uh, as a QA analyst at Cross Technologies, right? I think that's correct. You know when you start there? I start May 10th. Ooh, not much of a break right after graduation. No. <laughs> that's what Dr. Johnson said too. So you have that and you did musical theater for five years. What types of performances were you involved in? Uh, I did Beauty and the Beast, The Little Mermaid, Adam's Family, the musical, Shrek, the musical, and Happy Days, the musical. I love Happy Days. So, okay, let's get uh, queued up for Miranda. I chose to do my research on the chemical changes in soil throughout the process of decomposition in order to determine PMI estimation. PMI can be defined as post-mortem interval, which is the time elapsed since death. And this is imperative in establishing a timeline for homicide investigations. Decomposition also does play a very important role in forensic investigation, as the body does begin decomposing four minutes after the time of physiological death, which is the time when organs when organ function completely halts. So typically when an ME arrives on scene, they take three different types of temperature, which is the core temperature, the forehead temperature, and the ambient temperature. And they use typically the core temperature and eyeballing the stage of decomposition to attempt to determine a time of death. As you'll see in this figure one, you can see the core temperature, forehead temperature, and ambient temperature, and how quickly they tend to cool since the time of death laid out. As you'll see the core temperature, tends to cool a lot more quicker than the forehead temperature. And then the ambient temperature is usually the temperature of the environment in which the body was found. So this research is important because postmortem interval estimations tend to be wide hours and tend to prove either inaccurate or vague. And recently laboratory-based identification methods of time of death have been moving towards the forefront of forensic research. So using different types of chemical markers potentially could allow it so that the focus is not completely reliant on remains, but more so on the chemistry of the environment as well as the chemistry of the remains rather than the physical look of the remains. So the current method of postmortem interval estimation is using this time of death equation, which is shown on screen. And the time of death equation is time of death equals 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit minus corpse core temperature degrees Fahrenheit over 1.5. And more, time, more often times than not, the ME does use the corpse core temperature as opposed to the forehead temperature because it's a more accurate uh, measurement of the body's internal temperature. So 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit breaking down this equation is the, is the average body temperature of the human body and then the 1.5 that's shown on the bottom is um, uh, degrees lost, is an estimation of 1.5 degrees lost per hour since time of death. So there are some errors that scientists have played out with this equation. The biggest one being that the body temperature is assumed to be 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. When oftentimes it fluctuates. Most human bodies do range around 98.6 degrees. However, there are some that run cooler, some that run warmer, and it's hard to know what this, what this potential victim's body temp average body temperature was. The other thing is this equation does not take into account the weather conditions. If it was a colder, if it was a colder area, hotter area, 
And it also doesn't take into account if the body had been stored in a hotter environment or a colder environment before being moved to the environment in which it, in which it was found. So the aim of this study was to analyze studies focusing on changes in soil chemistry due to cadaver decomposition, and then use these findings to help determine chemical changes in the validity of PMI estimation. As this was a literature-based study, Wiley Plus Library was accessed, and then the articles were refined using the keywords chemistry decomposition and a few others. From here, used a variety of articles were found. Some were kept for background information, but three key studies were identified. And these studies were then read and analyzed in order to conduct this research. The first study focused on ecological settings pre and post decomposition throughout the entire process of cadaver decomposition. They noted mostly that the nutrient levels tend to increase throughout the process of decomposition as you can see in figure two, there was an increase of flying maggot migration as well as fecal matter from insects, scavengers, predators, and grazers. And this whole diagram just demonstrates the differences in the ecological aspect of the environment as the, as the cadaver decomposes, what came, what left. It, and from this study, they also discovered that the body's decomposition rate is, is dependent on moisture, not solely, but greatly dependent on it. So if a body is in a thicker moisture soil, it will tend to have a lower uh, decomposition rate in comparison to a thinner sandier soil, which there will be a slight, a slightly increased rate in comparison to the moisture soil. They also found that the soil over time will become more acidic due to the release of fumes from the body and the release of various bodily fluids and acids. The second study focused on the soil chemistry, specifically as cadavers decompose. Um, they used two different environments, a grave sample environment as well as a control sample environment. And within these two environments, there was a clay loom, sandy and organic soil set up. And from here, they, they found that there was an increase in the chemical levels of the grave samples, However, there was a decrease in almost all chemical levels in the control samples. So as you'll see in the grape samples, specifically calcium carbonate levels did increase and there was an increase in the organic matter. And there was a slight change in all of the pHs of each level. There was not much change in the nitrogen levels, not any actually in the loom grape sample. This contrasts the change in control species as there is decreases in every level except for a slight increase in the pH of the loom control. And this is due to the fact that these samples, the cadavers were wrapped in material before being placed into their environments. So there was no room for any outside influence. The final study was focusing on the changes in water versus terrestrial environments. So they compared the differences in soil and water environments specifically a freshwater and saltwater environment, as well as a fertilized sample, organic sample, sterile sample, and open air sample of soil. Um, so these pig cadavers were placed directly into these environments and checked periodically over the span of six months. As you can see in figure five, this is an example of a couple of, per, of, a couple of the setups used. From this study, they found that there is an increase in acidity levels and nutrient levels in the soil samples. However, the water yielded less nutrients than the other environments. So in this study, focusing on grave, grave soil and control sample soil, there was a significant change in the chemistry, which was similar to what was shown in the terrestrial versus the water ecosystem study. From these, a determination was made that there's a possibility samples could be taken from the surrounding area of, in which the body was discovered to create an average basis for what is common for that environment before taking measurements of the soil in the area directly where the cadaver was found to create a basis and try and determine the flux in these chemical markers uh, in comparison to the 
environment that was not affected by the cadaver decomposition. Clearly, other factors of the environment would need to be considered, and this research does require more um, in-depth expansion on. But overall, all three studies did demonstrate that there would be some change in the soil that could potentially affect the soil chemistry and allow for further markers and PMI estimation. So some benefits of this study is it can be used at smaller labs that may not necessarily have the equipment that larger metro labs do to be able to pinpoint all soil markers. They may have to resort to using on-scene testing kits for different chemicals, such as calcium carbonate or nitrogen. So this would allow for them to have more access and more ability to use a newer, a newer way to determine post-mortem interval. And like I said before, this fits for further investigation into this kind of area of forensic research, but also potentially an environmental aspect on the lasting effects of decomposition on an ecosystem. Thank you. So do we have any questions from Randa? Um, I'm going to unmute myself. I have Miranda on the phone so that she can hear us. And then that way she can talk through her questions as well. Can you hear us okay now, Miranda? Hey. Wonderful. So Justin did have a question that came up in the text. It says, was this always going to be a literature project or did you originally plan on having a lab-based project? I did originally have a, a plan on having a lab-based project. Um, I initially wanted to use uh, dead mice and bury them in a few different types of soil environments, um, a sterile soil environment, a fertilized soil environment, and then I had an open air environment as well as just a general soil environment that I was going to collect from outside. And I was going to measure them over the span of about six weeks and test the different acidity levels of the soil over time. That was going to be my follow-up question, so thank you. <laughs> so I'll ask a follow-up question to that then. Uh, based on uh, your literature uh, review then, so what do you think you would have found if you had conducted the experiment in the laboratory? Well, I actually found what I was looking for in the literature review from what I was hoping to find in my project. Originally, I had discussed measuring calcium levels as well as pH levels in the soil and potentially magnesium levels if I had been able to conduct my uh, conduct the experiment. And I found that there was an increase in the calcium carbonate levels in the soil throughout the process of the one study and that there was changes in the pH and that the soil actually did become more acidic over time. So that was what I was hoping to find when, when I was potentially gonna conduct my experiment and I did find it in my literature. Uh, the question I had too along those lines is yeah, you chose uh, mice, uh, but the other studies looked at maybe larger uh, organisms. Did you choose mice for a reason? I was trying to find something that was more cost effective. And not as ucky, maybe when it decomposes? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyone have any last questions from Miranda? Great job on teamwork, guys. You should all be proud of yourself. Thank you, Carly, for helping out with that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Carly. <laughs> That was an okay. innovative technical solution. Uh, that worked out very well. I, I am very appreciative of that. So good job, everyone. We'll get ready to move on. I can see Caleb is now kind of sweating maybe there a little bit in his uh, chair. So Caleb Forbes is up next. Uh, his post-graduation plans are getting a job and working, right? That sound good? Yes, I have a job offer in Petoskey, and I have one um, that I want to try to get in Grayling. Wonderful. That is great to hear. Uh, and his fun fact is he likes helping other people. So if you ever need anything, call him. Heavy things moved, <laughs> things like that. Uh, Caleb is your person for that. Okay, any uh, other questions, logistic things, anything we need to do before we get ready for this one to get queued up? Okay, here we go. This is the last one before our break. Hi, my name is Caleb Forbes, and I will be presenting on the comparison of finger mark chemical enhancement sequences on physical developer quality. Why study fingerprints? Fingerprints are a form of identification that goes all the way back to the Qin Dynasty in China on pottery and documents. 
Fingerprints are more unique than DNA as there is a one in 64 billion chance that your fingerprint will match that of somebody else's in the entire world. Whereas with DNA, you can have similar genetic markers to a sibling, or you can have almost identical DNA to that of a twin, making it incredibly hard for the forensic scientist to distinguish between the two. This is why finger, fingerprint identification is easily the most valuable tool to a forensic scientist's arsenal. Fingerprint identification was not accepted in the courts of England until 1902. Before that, it was accepted in other countries such as India and China. As certain sweat glands are directly responsible for the deposit of your fingerprint on a surface. As certain sweat glands are numerous on your hands and feet. As certain sweat glands contain inorganic and organic components. These inorganic and organic components are what chemical enhancement tests react with. Some of these chemical enhancement tests are 1,8-diazofluorine-9-1, also known as DFO. Then there's 1,2-indane-dione, IND, 1,2-indane-dione, zinc, IND, ZN, ninahydrin, and the physical developer. We will only be using 1,2-indane-dione, zinc, and I will soon explain why. These chemical enhancement tests are then ran through a particular sequence for your fingerprint on a surface. This particular sequence runs through all the chemical enhancement tests and then uses the physical developer last because the physical developer has the, great, has the greatest destructive capability to a fingerprint. Ninohydrin adheres to the amino acids found in estrogen sweat, and, and when it reacts with the amino acids found in estrogen sweat, it produces a Raman's purple as seen on the right. The chemical structure of ninohydrin can be seen on the left. DFO is also an amino acid creation and reacts with the amino acids found in estrogen sweat and is unique because it has fluorescent properties at room temperature under a blue-green light filter. The fingerprint on the right is a fingerprint treated with DFO under a blue-green light filter, and the chemical um, structure of DFO is on the left. INDZN is superior in its fluorescent properties to that of DFO in every way, and the synthesis of INDZN is cheaper than ninohydrin and DFO, making it the new standard in some countries, such as Israel, because of its cheapness to synthesize and its superior fluorescent properties. However, IND ran by itself is not superior to that of DFO. Only IND treated with zinc prior to being exposed to a fingerprint is superior to that of DFO. Looking at the fingerprint on the right, you can see that the IND CN is definitely superior to that of DFO and IND structure is seen on the left. When a fingerprint is exposed to water because of the amino acid solubility, the amino acids um, come off of it and it only leaves the insoluble components on the fingerprint. These, this is what makes the physical developer particularly unique because it reacts with the insolu insoluble inorganic components found in estrogen sweat, such as chlorides. So if the weapon was, a murder weapon was dropped in the water, you could still use the physical developer to process the fingerprint on the murder weapon, lift it, and then run it through APHIS. This was the literature review project. Two search engines were used, Google Scholar and ScienceDirect. From there, I then narrowed it down with keywords such as Ninhydrin, DFO, physical developer, IND, ZN. And then from there, I looked at the FBI's procedures on how they make it and um, apply it to a fingerprint. Two rating scales were used in this experiment. The one rating scale was the University of Canberra rating scale, also known as the UC rating scale. Um, it looks at how a secondary test is affected from a primary test, the primary test being 
DFO or INDCM. If the rating is negative, it prefers a DFO sequence. If it is positive, the um, chemical enhancement test prefers an INDCN sequence. If it is zero, it's indifferent about which sequence it has ran in and develops equal number of fin finger marks in both sequences. The second rating scale is called the home office rating scale, also known as the HO rating scale. The HO rating scale looks at how many additional finger marks are developed from that chemical enhancement test and minutia points. Minutia points are small characteristic points in a fingerprint that determine one person from another person. This project was conducted at two locations, one in Canberra, the other one in Sydney, with 18 participants. It, these 18 participants were from different ethnicity and physiological sex, and the two locations offered a range of different temperature and humidity. From these 18 participants, we were able to construct a bar graph. Looking at this bar graph, you can clearly see that INDCN is superior to that of DFO from the number of additional finger marks developed. And when looking at just the physical developer, you can see that the physical developer has far more finger marks developed on sequence two than on sequence one, meaning that the physical developer prefers sequence two over sequence one. Although this change is small, it is unique and should be investigated further. Future things I would like to see done is looking at the physical developer ran by itself as a control and then compare it to the physical developer ran in sequence two and the physical developer ran in sequence one. I would also be interested in seeing um, under what um, concentrations the physical developer works at its optimum best and if um, the concentrations of all the tests done before it affect it and under what concentrations the previous tests enhance the um, physical developer even more. These are my references. And if you have any questions at this point, please ask now. And thank you. Okay, do we have any questions for Caleb? As you guys, did you guys, you know, the students come up with some pack to not ask each other questions so you didn't have to answer them? Is that what's really going on here? <laughs> okay, I'll start off then. Caleb, uh, so when you went through this, uh, the sequences you described, wh which one ended up uh, the literature, you know, providing to be the better sequence to go down? Like, you might have to define that a little more because INDCN was superior to that of DFO and the physical developer was superior ran in sequence too. So like. Okay, well, I guess the follow-up question is if I'm in a crime lab and want to go through these, I guess, why would I care about having multiples? Why, why would these sequences matter? Okay, <clears throat> so you want... You want the sequence that provides the most um, finger marks and most development with more minutia points, because the more minutia points you have, the greater matching capability you have to match it to somebody um, that is recorded in the APHIS. Um, um, gen APHIS is a generated program of all the people's fingerprints. So like the more the more characteristics you have on a fingerprint, the greater you can match it to somebody. So that's that's why sequence two would be better right now because it has a greater development for the physical developer. Overall, the um, sequence one goes a little further, but with some help, if it was further investigated, sequence two could outdo sequence one. I'll buy into that. How about any other questions that came up for Caleb? I have a quick question. I saw that you mentioned that um, after had 
reactive water that the more inorganic substances that are part of the fingerprint are what actually made the development. That was, is that correct? Is that what was discussed? Yes. So well, um, I just wanted to ask what some of those inorganic components were. So the forensic community has um, a few ideas exactly on what the physical developer reacts with. They're not 100% sure, but when the physical developer is deposited onto a fingerprint, they theorize that it reacts with the chlorides in a um, fingerprint and silver chloride being insoluble in water um, is why it's able to grow on the fingerprint. Now the growing process, you have to stop at some point, otherwise it grows beyond a point and then um, you can't lift the print with great detail. But um, J.R. Morris in the 1970s, when it was first um, found, theorized that there was trigger components. And these trigger components, he theorized the number one being chloride and the other one being um, an ester, ironically. Um, and the, so there's not 100% sure assurance that they're know what it reacts with, but they're like, it's a 90% assurance that it's the chlorides that trigger this reaction process. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions for Caleb? Let's see if Dr. Wright's still paying attention. Dr. Wright, are you there? Nothing for you? I'm here. Oh, see, he is paying attention. Nothing else? Okay, that is it for Caleb. So we are still moving right along on track. We are now reached the intermission portion of our morning talk set. So, uh, Matt Kieran is going to be up next at 1040. We will start promptly um, at that time. So you have a few minutes break. I encourage everyone to, to go get a drink, stretch your legs uh, before we begin the next sequence. Uh, if you're interested, I am going to put on some nice relaxing jazz music here, uh, here in just a second. You're welcome to listen to that uh, until we get back. Everyone, we'll see everyone in just a few minutes. Hello, thank you for the introduction. Today, I will be discussing my senior research, which is detecting heavy metals in nutritional supplements. Nutritional supplements have grown in use and popularity over the last couple of years. They're utilized in healthcare with patients recovering from surgeries, as well as with patients in oncology to allow them to have a convenient source of nutrients for their diets. They've also begun to see widespread use in the military and first responder populations as we have seen that about 60% of active duty military members utilize them in some way, shape or form. They're also being utilized by athletes, young and old, and seen as a necessity for good athletic performance. This increase in popularity has raised some questions about the quality and control of these nutritional supplements. Current FDA regulations does not require third party testing of these nutritional supplements and does not have actionable limits for the possible contaminants that could be present. A compliance study done in 2017 of nine different companies found that three had received letters from the FDA for inadequate manufacturing practices, two had to recall products, and one was found to have inadequate testing. With the increase in popularity of these nutritional supplements, along with their use in healthcare, it seemed appropriate to be in the investigation of the effectiveness of the current FDA regulations in ensuring the purity and quality of these nutritional supplements. This experiment utilized heavy metals as an example contaminant to gauge the purity of these nutritional supplements and compare them to the limits set forth for bottled water by the FDA. The experiment began with the percent water determination of the nutritional supplements. This was done to allow us to estimate an aliquot volume that would be appropriate for us to quantify the heavy metals of interest in these nutritional supplements. The nutritional supplements were then digested using acid digestion in conjunction with microwave digestion to allow us to break down the large molecules present to allow them to be processed in the ICPMS instrument without clogging the nebulizer tip. Three digestion blanks were also processed in parallel with our nutritional supplements to allow us to account for any contamination that was added in from our processing through the digestion process and through the preparation of the samples for the ICPMS instrument. The samples and digestion blanks were diluted and several calibration standards were created to allow us to form a standard curve to compare the mass spectra to that were collected later from the nutritional supplements to determine the concentrations of the heavy metals. The mass hunter software was set up to allow us to process it, the samples and digestion blanks in the ICPMS instrument. 
This experiment utilized ICPMS to detect the heavy metals in the nutritional supplements, and the processing was done over a couple of hours, and mass spectra were collected for the nutritional supplements and the digestion blanks, and were compared to the standard curve to allow us to determine the heavy metal concentrations in the nutritional supplements. Once the heavy metal concentrations were collected for each supplement, a, an ANOVA statistical analysis test was done to test for variability between the three nutritional supplements, along with an ANOVA statistical analysis test done to test for variability between the three supplements and the FDA regulation for bottled water for that specific heavy metal. This experiment utilized three different nutritional supplement brands shown here in this figure. We utilized Boost, Ensure, and Unjury. We utilize these three nutritional supplements due to their widespread use in the local hospital here in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, War Memorial. Three 200 microliter aliquots were tested of each supplement as this was the determined volume from the percent water calculations that would allow us to quantify the heavy metals of interest. All of the aliquots were digested using an EP the EPA method 3052, which utilizes a nitric acid digestion in conjunction with microwave digestion. Shown here are the elements that are able to be detected utilizing this di acid digestion process with the ICPMS instrument that we utilized. As previously stated, three digestion blanks were processed in parallel with our samples, and they were added in here and digested along with our samples to account for any contamination that was added in from our processing, such as digestion and the addition of the dilution later. The samples and digestion blanks were diluted by a factor of 250. As previously stated, several standards were created for the formation of the standard curve later. Here we can see the, the concentration of the mineral elements, trace elements, and the concentration of mercury present in all six standards. The samples, along with the calibration standards and the digestion blanks, were all placed on the auto sampler rack, and the pre-checklist was completed for the ICPMS instrument to ensure that no everything was in working order and we, all the washes were filled and we were able to run the instrument properly. This experiment utilized the Agilent 7800 inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry system shown here in this figure in conjunction with the SPS4 auto sampler shown here. This was done to allow us to accurately quantify these metals in solution with the detection limit as low as one part per billion. However, these detection limits varied from element to element. Several elements were also be able to be detected at once, so it didn't require us to run the sample several times. We were also able to easily account for any errors that were present in these detections as through the interpretation of the mass spectra along with how the machine was set up and different parameters were set. This ICPMS system, along with the EPA method 3052 for digestion that was utilized, has been shown before to work in a milk sample study done in 2018 that was also investigating similar heavy metals in these milk samples. This allowed us to infer that this should work for our nutritional supplements as the milk samples and the nutritional supplements would have a very similar high organic matrix. Here in this graph, we can see the average heavy metal concentrations for all three nutritional supplements. First, we can see here Boost is in blue, and Sure in green, and yellow is Unjury. Then the last column in orange is the FDA regulation for that specific heavy metal. The ANOVA test done on lab between the three supplements found that there was variability. This is due to the low uh, average concentration of lead found in the Unjury sample. It also found that there was variability between the three supplements and the FDA regulation. This is, again, due to the average concentration being very low in lead and being significantly lower than the FDA regulation. There is no variability indicated in the three supplements in the average detection of mercury. However, there was variability detected between the three average concentrations and the FDA regulation. This is evidently due to all three of them having a very low concentration of mercury and, the, and being significantly below the FDA regulation. The statistical analysis is for arsenic was a little bit more of a challenge to interpret, as we can see, due to the high standard deviations of both boosts and Ensure. It was indicated that there was no variability between the three nutritional supplements. However, we can see that Unjury does seem to be far below both boosts and Ensure in their average concentration of arsenic. This is due to the, again, the high standard deviations of both of these supplements. It was also indicated that there was no variability between the three supplements and the FDA regulation for arsenic, as again, the high standard deviations of both arsenic and boost indicated that there was no, no significant difference between all of these 
However, if we compared only the un average concentration of injury to the FDA regulation, we can see that it is significantly lower than the FDA regulation for arsenic. Finally, cadmium indicated that there was variability between the three supplements. This is seen because of the high average concentration in boost, and that is significantly higher than the other two nutritional supplements. We can also see that there was the boost was significantly higher than the FDA regulation, and this was also indicated that there was variability between the three supplements and the FDA regulation for cadmium. Here we can see several other elements that were detected in this research project, bandium, cobalt, thorium, and uranium. These metals are not necessarily heavy metals, however, they do pose a human health risk when at high enough concentrations. They were not at relatively high concentrations in these nutritional supplements. However, they do allow us to make some more inferences about the errors of our experiment. In the detection of cobalt, along with the detection of thorium, we can see that there is a relatively high standard deviation in the detection of insure compared to the detection of boost and injury. And again, here for boost, this could indicate that there was a possibility that the insure supplement was not fully homogenous. So the dispersion of the elements in that bottle were not necessarily uniform. As we have seen from this research project, several of the elements were above the FDA regulation for bottled water. However, it is not a perfect comparison due to the fact that the expected volume of water ingested in a day is not the equal equivalent to the expected amount of these nutritional supplements. You would need to drink about five and a half bottles to reach the limit for lead and about 10 bottles to reach the limit for cadmium and arsenic. These heavy metals being present, however, does indicate that there is some possible contamination by these metals that is not being accounted for in the manufacturing process. The results of this experiment definitely warrant further investigation, possibly utilizing a wider array of nutritional supplement brands as an, and along with more repetition of the ICPMS analysis of each brand. Due to the error of this experiment and the low amount of Samples taken, we are not able to say for sure that there is a need for increased regulations. However, it could support this need later down the line, especially with further investigation involved. Thank you for your time. Okay, does anyone have any questions for Matt? Yeah, I have a question maybe. Hi. Go ahead, Dr. Etsy. This is all your show now. Thank you. No, no, I just, yeah, I'm just wondering. Now, Matt told us that, you know, it's possible, possibly dangerous to drink bottled water or any other water for that matter. I believe if you drink four liters of water in one hour, you would be dead anyway. Uh, yes. However, my question is, have you ever considered to test a spring waters. Spring waters normally considered very clean and people were drinking them without any boiling or treatment for millennia. And if you're gonna analyze any clean spring water, you probably will find more dangerous elements than this. So what gives? Should we drink water or should we drink something else? Well, the <laughs> levels that we use to compare to were generally there just because it's honestly the only thing, the only beverage that the FDA currently regulates. So we just needed a benchmark value to allow us to compare to. So that's why we utilized it. Um, I know there was, this, I read one study that they were testing for arsenic in different runoffs and different groundwater areas. Um, and they had found it pretty at pretty high levels in those um, different samples. So you're correct. It's probably never going to be perfectly safe to drink any water, but this was just the regulations that were available to us that we could compare to, if that answers your question. Well, yeah. yeah. Uh, I would like to point out to, to Dr. Etsy's question. For most of that, it was a couple of millennia, the average lifespan was, what, like 35? So I'm not sure that drinking you know, spring water was always the best idea. In your defense there, Matt. So. <laughs> Uh, I did have another question. You mentioned uh, you diluted your samples 200 times. Uh, do you have any thoughts on why you did that? Or 250 times, I think? I think we mainly did that to allow it to aerosolize correctly, um, just so it wasn't pure acid in our samples running through the ICPMS system. The I think the dilution just allowed it to uh, 
aerosolize a little better and have just a little more, a um, little less cor like corrosion ability to it is what I would assume. Um, but yeah. Anyone else have any other questions? I was just gonna follow up on Dr. Rusky's point. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, his notion that spring water is, is always safe is well supported by the literature. There's plenty of examples with elevated uh, arsenic, for instance, and big problem in Bangladesh, but parts of the United States as well. So, you know, that can be overtly toxic. Uh, Dr. Wright, I enjoyed the background commentary. It sounds like you are joined by someone that is small. <laughs> yeah, and if you give a mouse a cookie, it's gone too. <laughs> okay, any last questions for Matt? If not, good job, Matt. Okay, we are going to head into our next speaker. Are you ready, Mindy? Yeah. Okay, this is not so bad. It's pre recorded. So what I have for Mindy's uh, postgraduate uh, plans is uh, looks like you almost have a job at North Coast Provisioning. That's a recent development. Congratulations on that. What are you going to be doing there? Blood tender. Nice. Nice work on that. Uh, and then I have for your fund pact, do you work at a credit union for four and a half years? Yeah, but she must not have given you the updated one. Oh, what do you have for an updated? You're welcome to tell me. Okay. I was I played Hansel in a high school play in Hansel and Gretel. Interesting. My Hansel, because my voice is deeper than the other girls. <laughs> I, I myself never did high school musical stuff. Okay, we are headed toward our next speaker. I'm going to go same process. Everyone's still hearing me okay? No logistic questions? Anything on that regard? Okay. And we are going to get ready for Mindy's presentation. I'm Minty Mundaika, and today I will be talking about moisture content and water activity in cannabis plants. Moisture analysis tests are required in the cannabis industry, along with a variety of other industries. There are a variety of testing methods, and there are many different factors that contribute to water content and water activity. Cannabis plants have the ability to change behavior based on different levels of water intake. So some of the other industries that use moisture analysis is the dental industry. They use moisture analysis to determine the brittleness of teeth. The geographic information system, often referred to as GIS, which is a huge mapping industry, they use moisture analysis to test the soil moisture. Pharmaceuticals use it to test the water content in their medications. So why is moisture analysis important? It's important to know how water and nutrients flow through the plant. And it's also important to understand why we perform moisture analysis tests. It all has one common end goal, and that is to keep the consumer safe. It is a new topic that could use more research. More information could be beneficial to those who are already in the cannabis industry or those who are looking to get into the cannabis industry. So a couple of different terms that are very important to distinguish between are water content and water activity. Water content refers to the percentage of water within a substance. And this scale ranges from 0% to 100%. Water activity, however, refers to how tightly bound molecules are to the structure that it is in. This scale ranges from zero to one, zero being nowhere near pure water and one being pure water. So a good way to think about this would be to think of a water soaked sponge. So if you've got a sponge that is soaked full of water, the water content is gonna be very close to 100% considering the weight of the sponge in comparison to the weight of the water, the water is going to outweigh that of the sponge. However, in terms of water activity, that water soaked sponge is going to be closer to zero on that scale because those water molecules aren't what the sponge is. The sponge is completely different. It's water is not a part of the sponge's structure naturally. And then there's moisture analysis. Moisture analysis refers to the humidity levels that are within the plant 
and humidity refers to the different levels of water vapor present. I went about doing my research by choosing three main search engines. I used PubMed, Core, and Google Scholar. And from those, I was able to look at peer reviewed literatures and find images to aid along with my literature reviews. And for searching, I use key terms such as moisture analysis tests, water activity in cannabis, water content in cannabis, and water in cannabis. Then I took all of that data, compiled it down into one paper. So the different methods that I had found that people are using to test moisture analysis were drying ovens, moisture meters, and moisture balances. To use a drying oven, you would have to weigh the sample and then you would set your oven to whatever temperature it is that you are looking for it to be run at. You would place the sample in the oven and you would wait for the sample to be brown and crispy. Then you would take the sample out of the drying oven and reweigh it again. And then you would then calculate the water content from that. Then we have the moisture meter, which what you would do is you would just take the meter, have your sample on a piece of plastic and you would take the meter and press it up against the sample where the piece of plastic is just there for support. You get your reading in about a few seconds. It's very, very quick. Whereas if you use a moisture balance, you are going to be taking your sample, distributing it, distributing it evenly in a small plastic dish, putting a lid on it, putting it in the instrument, and then you would close the lid and run it. You'll obtain your results within about five minutes. Different water percentage standards are required based on the stage of production. So after Initially drying the product, you're going to want to look for a water content that ranges between 14 to 15%. After curing the product, you want 11 to 12% water content. However, vape products should be cured only to about 12 to 15% water content because vape products are based off of water vapor. Now, based on what you're looking to get out of the product is also going to determine what level of water content you should have. So for a pleasant smoke, you're going to want 10 to 12% water. And for a harsher, more dry smoke, you're going to want to look for 10% or less. And in medicinal products, you want that range to be set between 6 and 9%. That reason being is because you want to prolong shelf life and that lower water content will increase your potency. So Shimadzu, a company had done their own experiment using their own instrument. They used their MOC63U, which was a moisture balance that had a little drying chamber up above it. So it was able to constantly monitor that water loss, the water weight loss. And they had done samples in triplicate at three different temperatures. They ran the samples at 105 degrees Celsius, 110 degrees Celsius, and 120 degrees Celsius. Now the results came to the samples that were run at 120 degrees Celsius had a higher water loss over the course of the 15 minutes that each sample was run. These results were expected because the higher the temperature the higher the rate of evaporation. We should be performing moisture analysis on cannabis multiple times throughout the process just to ensure that they are within those levels because depending on the environment, their evaporation can happen and then you've got a lower percentage, which is important to monitor and keep track of. And again, like I had said, based on the intended, pro intended product, the water content percentage is going to change. So which method of using of testing for moisture analysis is the best? It's not necessarily that one's the best. It's just you, you want to base it more off of your intended purpose. So for example, if you're going to be using it on a commercial scale, you're going to want bigger instrumentation, which allows for more product to be ran at one time. So a drying oven is something that would be more feasible because you're going to be 
using larger batches. However, if you're just going to be using it on a personal scale, a moisture meter may maybe a moisture balance, but a moisture meter would probably be your best bet. In a lab setting, if it's just small scale testing, a moisture balance would be beneficial in that case. The most common method is where you take the initial mass, you dry it out, drying oven, and then you would reweigh and calculate your water percentages yourself. Environmental factors do have a role. So in your wet environments or if there's overwatering that's occurring, your plant will drown out. Now in dry environments or underwatering, uh, that will result in poor growth of the plant and it will end up creating, having the plant wilt, which is not good. So it causes stress in that sense. Humidity, that's important for aiding in the balance of evaporation. Lower humidity levels result in more water and nutrient uptake. I am now able to answer any questions that anyone may have. Does anyone have any questions for Mindy? Um, I do have one question. Um, in terms of the, in, like I know the environmental factors obviously are more so for plants grown outside, but how are you seeing the water content related in specifically like marijuana plants that are grown in greenhouses? That's going to be more dependent on how often they're being watered and like the temperature that they're being stored at because if they're going to be stored at like a higher temperature that water is going to evaporate out of the plant faster but if they just keep being over watered then they're going to end up drowning out same thing if they're not getting enough water to begin with then they're just going to wilt i hope that answers your question yeah, thank you. <laughs> I also had a, a question. Do you have any, you, you mentioned actually a couple of times how potency can be affected by water content. Can you tell me what you mean by that? Yeah, so if there's a lot, if there's more water within the plant, it's gonna account for more of the plant. So then your potency levels are gonna be kind of like, almost like diluted in a sense because of the water being present, but um, once that water is removed, you now have your other components, your cannabinoid content, like your THC or CBD contents present. So does that mean that you could maybe change the potency value by adjusting the moisture content? I mean, that, from a reported standpoint? I'm going to be honest, I don't really know how to answer that. Uh, if we lower the moisture content and the CBD content stays the same, does the, the, the overall percentage that you report, does that change anything? The percentage in the plant should still be the same. But the percent mass then changes a little bit, right? The overall percent mass. So that's kind of what you're pointing at. So there is some variability. Uh, and I think Michigan's regulations are kind of vague in this regard um, as to what is required. So any other questions for... Mindy, how are we doing on time? We're doing pretty good. Any other questions? Okay, Nick Rogers, postgraduate application or plans are to get a job. I just found out in the greater Detroit area, right? That's where you're headed toward? Correct, yeah. So if anyone knows of any employment opportunities, point them in his direction. So Nick's fun fact is he has worked in a pharmacy for eight years. That's a long time. What are you doing in a pharmacy, Nick? Originally, I wanted to be a pharmacist, but after working in one for so long, you kind of get burned out and lose that idea of wanting to do that. So, Did you work in the same pharmacy for the whole eight years? I did Walgreens for six of that and then Walmart for two. Very good in that regard. So besides my epic, uh, you know, flub there on that PowerPoint thing where I could not see it and you guys apparently could, um, as far as that goes, any other technical, we're still doing okay on the audio? Okay. We will go ahead and then begin Nick. Hi there. My name is Nick Rogers and I did my experiments on the fighter remediation of contaminated soil using hemp. What is phytoremediation? 
It's a type of soil reme remediation involving the treatment of polluted soils using plants that can and will grow in these contaminated soils. There's a viable mitigation strategy to decontaminate areas such as old farmlands and old mining operations. Um, typically, the harvested materials of the hemp plant cannot be used due to the heavy metal concentrations that are found in the plant after harvesting. Uh, here on the right, you can see a diagram of a phyto phytoremediation process occurring. Uh, in yellow, you have the pollutants that are found in the soil, the heavy metals. Um, and there, the extensive root system of the hemp plant uh, accumulates those and then they uh, typically it makes its way through the stem and then up into the leaves and uh, the flower of the hemp plant itself where it's stored. Hemp or cannabis sativa, its usage for textile purposes can be traced back to 8000 BC in China. Uh, it was made into ropes and canvases. Um, it's hypothesized that the hemp plant accumulates a higher percentage of heavy metals because the flowering stage is much longer than most other plants being used for phytoremediation. And then, like I said before, the plant's extensive root system also makes a candidate to be used for phytoremediation. Uh, the hemp plant life cycle. Uh, for this, you have the germination. For myself, it did not take one to two weeks. It was about a two-day process of where you just put the seed uh, inside a wet paper towel and then uh, put it in a dark space and from there the seed sprouted and then it was placed into the contaminated soil or the medium to grow. Um, from there the seedling it takes about about a week or two for that to where um, it starts its first extensive root down in and then you see the two uh, leaves that grow off of that. Um, this is a very important stage in the growth of the plant as it is most susceptible to various stress, stressors from the environment, uh, such as under or over watering of the plant, uh, the soil pH, and then also like uh, the sun, or if it's not used to the sun beating down on it all day, well, it can get dried out very quickly that way. Second part of it is the vegetative state. And for this, high levels of nitrogen, moderate levels of potassium, and low levels of phosphorus are needed for optimal growth. Um, and then also with the flowering stage, that's a six to eight week period. Um, like I said before, the short vegetative stage paired with this longer two month flowering stage allows the plant to accumulate more heavy metals. The objectives of this experiment were first to see if the plant would grow in the contaminated soil and the secondary was to analyze the concentration of heavy metals inside the plant after harvest. Uh, the sample collection was done from a junkyard outside of Harbor Springs, Michigan in the Lower Peninsula here, uh, and that was chosen as a site to obtain the soil. Uh, a small sample was initially collected and digested with the Mars 6 microwave system. Uh, with nitric and hydrochloric acid. And then it was then analyzed using the Agilent 7800 ICP mass for heavy metal concentration in the soil. And then on the right here, you can see a picture I took of the area I took the soil from. So on this, there was a bunch of uh, appliances and uh, random metal things around there. And there was also areas that were filled with cars and also had cars previously in the past sitting there. And, possibly leaking oil and transmission fluid into the ground. Uh, the growing of the hemp was done here at Lake State and Crawford Hall in the greenhouse. Um, the feminized seeds were acquired from a company called Ag Marvels in Mount Pleasant, Michigan. 10 of them were germinated and planted in total. Uh, they were under a 200 by 10 watt light, light fixture. Um, with that, for the vegetative state, we used 18 hours of light and six hours of darkness as this was ideal for the vegetative state of growth. Um, the plants were also watered every 23 hours for 30 minutes at a time via an automated watering system. Right here on the right, you can see uh, the solo cups with the, uh, the seeds planted in them. This was probably the first week or so right after they had sprouted and start to grow. Um, and then you can also see the plastic tubing, which is the automated watering system. From here, the plants were harvested and dried at 45 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes. 
Um, the samples were divided into two parts, the root and the shoot part, and the shoot uh, was the stem and the leaves of the plant. Um, using the Mars 6 microwave digestion instrument and their own cannabis plant sample mode, along with the uh, nitric and hydrochloric acid uh, concentrations again, the samples were digested and then analyzed via our own Agilent 7800 ICPMS for the heavy metal concentrations. And then on the right, you can see a picture of the samples after they were digested and getting ready for the ICPMS. And here we have a graph of the heavy metal concentrations that were found in the plant samples. Uh, with this, there was six in particular that we went and looked over. Um, they were, we chose this, these six in particular because these are the ones that are regulated by the Michigan Marijuana Regulatory Agency. Uh, it consists of nickel, copper, arsenic, cadmium, mercury, and lead. Um, these are all uh, regulated by the MRA, like I said, and all cannabis products that are sold and grown throughout the state here. Um, in particular, the root samples did have a much higher concentration of heavy metals compared to the leaf part. As you can see on the left side of the graph is the leaf parts of the plant. And on the right side, you have the roots. Uh, and there you have elevated amounts of copper and also lead. And here is another graph of the heavy metal concentrations in plant samples. This was uh, five other heavy metals that were found in elevated amounts in the plants. These are not regulated by the state of Michigan. Uh, with this, you have zinc, chromium, manganese, iron, and barium. Uh, and also here you see the same trend where the root part of the samples uh, had a much higher concentration compared to the leaf parts. Uh, this included the zinc and the manganese. Uh, and here was an average concentration found in both the shoot and root parts of the plant. Um, for this, you can see once again, the roots had a much higher concentration compared to the shoot average. Um, in table two, you can see the, uh, the Michigan MRA heavy metals action limits for the marijuana flower concentrates and other marijuana products. Uh, and for this, you can see with uh, the lead in particular had a much higher amount compared to the action limits set by the MRA, as well as copper, um, where it's regulated in the marijuana concentrates. So the heavy metals found in the plant samples over the allowed MRA action limit were the copper, lead, and zinc. Um, like I said before, the roots had a much higher concentration compared to the shoot of the plants. Uh, this could be due to not all the soil being removed from the roots before digestion. Um, and also growing in the greenhouse here at Lake State uh, had a variable of uncontrolled temperature ranging from a low of 60 degree, 63 degrees Fahrenheit all the way up to 111 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, which is an issue because hemp does like to be grown about 70 degrees Fahrenheit for the optimal growth for it. And also a lack of soil nutrients could have neg negatively affected the growth as I did not uh, implement any extra nutrients to the soil besides what was in the ground from when I took the sample collections. And that is it. Thank you. Do you have any questions for Nick? A quick question. Sorry if I. Hey, Nick, I've got a question for you. So I, I noticed. Justin on, was uh, first. What's that? Never mind. Oh, so I, I noticed on some of your graphs uh, in the data you had, you had uh, in concentrations of microgram per gram, but you're comparing against parts per million. What's the conversion between micrograms per gram and part per million, or how are they related? Uh, with that, is it not microgram per gram? Like one, one of that is equal to one parts per million. Yeah, it is. I was just kind of curious why you had the two different scales for everything. I took the the parts per million. I just took it off of the MRA, and I, I didn't think about it. I kept it on there for some reason with that instead of converting them to the same uh, measurement there. And then I was also just kind of curious too. So you had the grow tent in Crawford this last year. I didn't even see where you guys had that. Yeah, there was a nice little dog cage set up in there in the back corner of the greenhouse in Crawford. 
You just stuck her in the doghouse. Yeah. <laughs> nice. There was a scientific tool, thank you, not a doghouse. You know, <laughs> it may have looked like that, but it kept me away from the cage. <laughs> Justin, you had a question, I think. Yeah, I'm sorry if I missed earlier in the presentation, but how long did you grow them before you harvested and digested them? So initially, I want I tried to start growing in about July, but I wasn't really able to get into Lake State uh, to be able to check everything so I didn't start growing until October um, and then from there I harvested in December because I was running out of time to do all the IPMS, I, uh, IPMS testing and um, like I said I think I discussed it too in there um, the plants really didn't grow at all due to the lack of nutrients and then a couple other things with the soil so there wasn't much of a vegetative growth there regardless even after the two-month period. Do you think you would have saw more a different distribution between roots and shoots if you had let the, if they were able to grow longer? I believe so. That was what my initial hypothesis would be that like the flowering part of the plant would have a higher accumulation um, compared to like say the leaves. I still think the roots probably would have had the same higher amount. Um, but yeah. All right. Thank you. The, uh, I had a question too. You, you talked about the roots and you just mentioned it, I think in your comments right there, had I mean, more. Uh, did you wash the roots before or was there soil on them? There was a little bit of soil. Like I said, they're, they were very, uh, they didn't grow out very much and they were very uh, delicate. Um, so after putting them in the oven, I, even before that, they were starting to break apart on me after I took them out of the soil. So I didn't want to agitate them anymore. Do you have any thoughts on whether the the difference you observed could be partly in due, you know, partly due to the fact that there was soil on there, or do you think it was all due to what the plant you know uptook? I believe a little bit is due to the soil that was left over on there. So yeah, if I were able to do do it again, I definitely would change some variables with or control more of the variables on the initial growth where they would you know grow out more and then. Um, uh, be able to wash the roots out to where there would be no more, a lot less soil left on them. Do you have any more questions? I have, I have one more, but I don't want to hog all the time. I, I have one real quick, if you don't mind. Oh, so, Dr. Etsy came on too. You're, oh, you're in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Nick, one of my thoughts is, is that uh, since you harvested only small plants because they didn't grow very well, right? Yeah. Uh, if they had grown more, it, do you think it's possible that the growth of the plant could have to some, some degree uh, outpaced the uptake of heavy metals out of your soil and you might have actually seen a biodilution factor as the plant grew? Um, I, I suppose, yeah, that would be a possibility of that. That's not something I didn't think of actually. Okay, that was my question. Dr. Retsky? I have, I don't know if it's a question suggestion, but I didn't see that you grow a control plant on the clean soil. And I would have a much better believe in your numbers if they were compared with the control plant and they would show no contamination. That was another thing I'd want, I, I didn't do and I would like to do with that if I had another chance at that to grow it against a control sample and a normal or your typical medium to grow hemp in, so. Mm -hmm. I'm glad I'm out. <laughs> Does have any other questions for Nick? Okay, good job, Nick. Uh, Jocelyn, you're up next. Are you ready? <laughs> yes, you. So uh, it looks like you're up for a job search. I am. And where are you looking to find a position in or what type of field? I'm looking mostly either at analytical work or somewhere related to like a state crime lab facility. Wonderful news in that regard. And then I have down here for your fun fact, only... Dorman Pinchers? You've only ever owned one type of dog? Yes. And my parents actually just picked up a new Doberman puppy last night. So I will get to meet him when I go home for the semester. 
How many dogs do you have in your house? Uh, that's the only one right now. So. Oh, the only reason I ask is my children are lobbying for a dog right now, and it's it's not winning, not winning, but they're trying. So I was just curious. So, okay, uh, with that, we'll go ahead and begin uh, Jocelyn's presentation. Hello, everyone. My name is Jocelyn Birch, and I will be presenting my literature-based research project on the effect of cleaning agents on presumptive blood tests and DNA analysis of blood stains. Blood is one of the most common types of physical evidence found at crime scenes involving physical violence. Once a blood stain has been located, DNA can be retrieved from the blood and be used to connect perpetrators to a crime. Being able to identify who was at a crime scene can provide valuable information needed to solve crimes. There can be times, however, when blood stains are hard to see or look similar to other types of stains. In order to detect the presence of blood, crime scene investigators will often use a presumptive blood test. These tests are rapid and simple to use, and many of them are based on an oxidation reaction. Hemoglobin in blood will act as a catalyst with the test and produce a fluorescence or a color change. Here we have an example here at the top of this picture of an unseen blood stain. And the picture on the bottom is the same blood stain after a presumptive test was applied. But now we can visually see the stain and know that there was once blood present here. The most commonly used presumptive blood tests are Luminal, Blue Star, and Castlemeyer. To give a little more background on the three most commonly used presumptive blood tests, Luminal is a powder that is mixed with hydrogen peroxide and a base. After Luminal is sprayed onto a blood stain, it is oxidized by hydrogen peroxide and is catalyzed by hemoglobin, which will form an unstable intermediate. As the Luminal returns to a lower energy state, a blue-violet or blue-green light is emitted. This light is called chemiluminescence and can be seen in a completely dark room. Blue Star is based off the chemical formula of luminal and is also mixed with hydrogen peroxide in a base. Blue Star will go through the same oxidation reaction as the one pictured in the previous slide to produce a blue chemiluminescence as seen in the picture on the right. Compared to luminal, Blue Star has a higher sensitivity and the Kevin luminescence is brighter and will last longer. Castlemeyer works by applying ethanol, hydrogen peroxide, and phenolphthalein to a sample of blood. The hydrogen peroxide will oxidize the colorless phenolphthalein into phenolphthalein, which will appear as the color pink. Hemoglobin catalyzes this reaction. Unlike luminol and blue star, Castlemeyer cannot be applied directly to a blood stain it must be applied to a swab of blood. There are often times blood stains from a crime scene are washed with household cleaners. Perpetrators will do this in an attempt to destroy evidence connecting them to the crime. Household cleaners not only have the potential to visually remove blood stains, but they can also damage DNA. Sodium hypochlorite and sodium percarbonate are two common ingredients that are found in household cleaners, such as those pictured on the right. Sodium hypochlorite is typically found in bleach, while sodium percarbonate is found in stain removers and laundry detergents. The objective of this review was to examine the effects household cleaners have on presumptive blood tests and DNA analysis. This review primarily focused on cleaners containing sodium hypochlorite and sodium percarbonate, as well as Luminal, Blue Star, and Castlemeyer presumptive blood tests. I selected journal articles for this review by dividing the project into two main concepts, presumptive blood tests and DNA analysis. I accessed Google Scholar and PubMed database and refined my search using blood stains, cleaning agents, sodium hypochlorite, and sodium percarbonate as keywords for the first concept, and blood stains, DNA analysis, and PCR for the second concept. From there, I selected journal articles for the first concept if they included washing blood stains with a household cleaner and testing the washed blood stains with a presumptive blood test. Journal articles selected for the second concept had to include extracting DNA from a blood stain washed with a household cleaner and determining DNA quantity and quality using gel electrophoresis and or PCR. When it came to the presumptive blood test, sodium hypochlorite and sodium percarbonate diminish the color of Luminal, Blue Star, and Castlemeyer. Using Castlemeyer as an example, when applied to a wash blood stain, 
a faint pink color may appear rather than the dark pink color that is normally associated with a reaction to blood. Blood stains washed with sodium percarbonate were not always detected by all three presumptive blood tests, with Castlemeyer being the most sensitive to its effects. These false negatives still occurred even when the blood stain could still be visually seen. Applying presumptive blood tests to sodium hypochlorite without any blood can create a color change and produce false positives. False positives using luminol or blue star can have the same chemiluminescence intensity as hemoglobin. Here we have an example of blue star that was applied to carpet and ceramic tile. In the top left hand corner, each of these surfaces was washed with the bleach containing sodium hypochlorite. And even though blood was not present, blue star still produced a chemiluminescence. The top right hand corner of each of these surfaces had blood that was unwashed. The bottom left hand corner has blood that was wiped once with the bleach, and the bottom right hand corner is blood that was fully washed with the bleach. And as we can see on the ceramic tile, the blood that was fully washed had a diminished chemiluminescence intensity compared to the blood that was not washed. And porous surfaces, such as carpet, were not as affected by the cleaners as non-porous surfaces. When it came to how cleaning products affected DNA analysis, there was significantly less DNA extracted from washed blood stains compared to unwashed blood stains. There was also significantly less DNA extracted from blood stains washed with sodium percarbonate than sodium hypochlorite, as is seen in these two graphs. These graphs also compared the amount of DNA extracted from cotton and silk fabrics. And as we can see, there was significantly more DNA extracted from the cotton, more porous fabric than the silk fabrics. The quality of DNA was examined using gel electrophoresis, and it was shown that sodium hypochlorite and sodium percarbonate produce some DNA degradation. Here in this picture, we can see the intact DNA bands of unwashed blood stains, and in this gel, we can see the sheer DNA bands of blood stains washed with bleach. It is important to understand how cleaning products work in order to understand the results that were seen. Sodium hypochlorite reacts with the hydrogen peroxide found in presumptive blood tests and will produce a positive result, just as hemoglobin would. When blood is washed with sodium percarbonate, the catalase enzyme in blood will convert the sodium percarbonate into hydrogen peroxide and will break down the blood. This produces the little to no color change seen in presumptive blood tests due to the lack of hemoglobin present. Understanding the results of a presumptive blood test relies on visually examining the color change that is produced by the test. When blood stains are washed with cleaning products, diminished or absence of a color change can result in misinterpreting if blood is present or not. If a blood stain is determined to be negative, valuable DNA could be lost. Fortunately, the quick bright chemiluminescence form from sodium hypochlorite can be distinguished from the gradual chemiluminescence form from hemoglobin. Crime scene investigators should take into consideration that blood stains could have been washed with a household cleaner and should understand how they interfere with presumptive blood tests and DNA analysis. Understanding the effects of washing blood stains with household cleaners could be further explored in additional studies that could include using different cleaning products and or presumptive blood tests than the ones used in this review. It could also compare the effects of washing the blood stains with different washing techniques. For example, hand washing versus machine washing. Blood stains could be placed on different surfaces and comparing the effects of different concentrations of cleaning products. I would like to thank Professor Southwell for advising me through this project and to Dr. Johnson for helping me choose my topic of research. Thank you. Okay, does anyone have any questions for Jocelyn? I have one, Jocelyn, actually. Um, so you were talking in the beginning, you were talking about Blue Star and how one of the benefits of it was the luminescence was lasted longer. Um, do you, did you look into like why that was? Was it due to like the stability of that intermediate? I didn't look into it too much. I know because part of the problem with like Blue Star because it's uh, manufactured by like a specific company um, in terms of like how they manufacture it and it's 
specific ingredients, um, that's like a company secret for it. So especially like when you try to look into it, it they just more advertise saying like it is brighter. They don't. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I have a quick question. Um, I saw that you mentioned hemoglobin is typically the catalyst in the reaction that produces the chemiluminescence. I know it wasn't part of your research specifically, but do you happen to know um, if there's like a statute of limitations, I suppose, on like how long a blood stain could sit there before maybe the hemoglobin would no longer react and produce that chemiluminescence? I know uh, some studies um, looked at that as like a, they, what they would do is when they would put the blood stains on whatever surface, some of them did look at uh, the aging of blood stains. Uh, so you're right, that wasn't specifically uh, my focus and but I know like the general trend was like DNA does degrade more over time and especially with the use of cleaners that could speed up that process so I think it does depend on what your uh, scenario is or how you are testing those blood stains. Thank you. I did have also a question so it kind of maybe tags on Justin's a little bit so when you're looking at these uh, presumptive tests and you, you mentioned you know they're reacting with the hemoglobin in there uh are, is human blood the only type of blood that will actually react with these um i believe i don't think so i know most of the studies i looked at did use human blood um but i know for one of them and maybe it wasn't the presumptive test it might have just been the well it, it was the presumptive test they used um porcupine blood because it was saying it was a similar uh, makeup to human blood. Hmm. Anyone else have any questions for Jocelyn? Okay, my last question then, uh, as far as that goes, uh, when you're doing presumptive tests, uh, what are the what's their actual function from a crime scene standpoint? Why why do we do them? So the reason you would use a presumptive blood test, um, especially whether if it's like a stain you find and it might look like a blood stain or if you're not sure, you can use it um, as a quick and easy test uh, there to see if it is blood, but it's not a confirmatory test. So which the difference between a confirmatory and a presumptive, the confirmatory is a for sure this is blood. And especially if you use a human confirmatory test to you know it's human blood, um, but the presumptive is just a quicker way and it's it's either going to give you a this is not blood or this is possibly blood good cool okay any last questions for jocelyn okay seeing no more congratulations thank you for that okay hopefully everybody is back um emily i will help to get your mailing address to, for your trivia prize there <laughs> you were the winner of the whatever room we were in, the Bunsen room. Yeah. Okay, so uh, last spring, we were not able to uh, give out awards for our outstanding graduates and clearly nobody's uh, present for them, but we're still going to send out some things. So uh, the prize that we will be giving this year for outstanding graduates is a cutting board uh, with the periodic table engraved on it that says I like to cook periodically. So if you are an outstanding graduate, you may stop by my office uh, next week to pick up your, your prize. Um, and we have them in the different categories. So for last year's 2020 graduates, the outstanding graduate in the area of chemistry, you also get a certificate, is uh, Sydney Smith. For uh, biochemistry was Sierra Strutz. And for forensic chemistry was Daphne Patton. All right, so those will be mailed to those students uh, with their addresses hopefully still on file. And the drum roll for this year's students, uh, the outstanding graduate of in the area of chemistry is Justin Blaylock. For biochemistry, Brendan Lukomsky. For forensic chemistry, Jocelyn Birch. And our first graduate of cannabis chemistry goes to Marielle Ball, who is not here, but that will be 
given to her as well. So you may congratulate all of the graduates and also our outstanding graduates. We have one more award to give for our uh, special faculty member who is retiring this year. Um, and he will be also getting the same thing that says uh, the 2021 Outstanding Professor of Chemistry and that goes to Dr. Dave Mighton. So Dave, you can stop by my office after to pick up your award that I had to hide when you popped into my office to look at them. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you very much. Okay, so if anybody has questions, they can stick around afterwards. We're happy to entertain them. Otherwise, thank you seniors for all of your hard work. Um, you did a great job today. Um, and we will, you will be getting a survey from me next week. And you can also fill out your class climate survey. Uh, that would be super helpful. Uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend. And thank you all of the attendees for coming to the senior presentation. Have a good one. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.